Hello, Reading. Welcome to this segment of Conversations with Reading Members of the Board of Selectmen. I'm Linda Phillips, your host. This series of shows includes interviews with all of our selectmen and the town manager and any guests they invite to visit with us. I want to introduce you to the people who make Reading a better place to live by their selfless service to our community. Today we're here to chat with selectmen Barry Berman, Daniel Ensminger, and John Halsey. The topics have been chosen by each selectman and the town manager. This segment discusses affordable housing, senior tax relief, tax class in tax classification from information that could not be included in previous segments but was too important to omit. We would like to hear from you regarding your interest in these shows. At the end of each, there will be an email address for you to respond to with your comments or suggestions. The selectman and town manager would love to get feedback on future topics and answer any questions you might have. Only emails that are signed will be responded to and we look forward to hearing from you. Let's begin with Mr. Berman. You mentioned in passing the housing and the 40B development. Could you explain to people a little bit more about um, the process of um, yeah. the developer, did, did he or didn't he? I, I wasn't really that close to the situation to pay attention. If he had actually expressed interest in renting first, or did he just go to the state and said, I'm going to do a 40B? So we're talking, I, I, I assume <clears throat> you're talking about the Lincoln Street, yeah. um, you know, where the Certainly Wood used to be. Um, yeah, so that was a 40B. He, did, um, he didn't come and raise his hand and say, oh, what can I do in Reading? Yeah. Basically, he bought the land and filed um, under 40B. Which is with the state, right? Which is with the state. And basically, any town that has less than 10% of its housing stock uh, that, that's not, you have to have 10% of your housing stock uh, deemed affordable, affordable to low and moderate income families, and then you have, you know, you sort of have a waiver from it. Reading was a little, you so know, we're chasing it, so we were below, below that. that then yeah. that gives exactly. them incentive to come in. Exactly. And so they can come in, and, and what a 40B does, it basically takes all the decision making from design and zoning really away from the town. Um, it, it, you get a comprehensive permit and, and essentially you lose the ability to kind of shape that project. Yeah. They can come in and say, we want to build, now, that, now they're putting affordable in there, but we want to build, you know, 70, you know, it's like you look at it and say, oh my God. And, and, and because we were able to kind of negotiate with the developer on Lincoln Street, I think it was five stories, we knocked a story down, we knocked some units down, but essentially they could have just said, sorry Reading, we're going right to the state. And, you know, so we had very little ability to kind of shape and direct that project. Now, take the 40R district, which is what we, town meeting, voted to kind of expand downtown. That's different. That allows CPDC um, huge um, guidance in terms of working with the developer, in terms of um, site planning and design. Um, they have to work with us in order to kind of get the things that, that they want. So uh, we have a lot more ability to kind of shape that project. And generally with a 40R come, not necessarily, but it's also kind of mixed use. So you have, you know, you have residential and commercial. So we have a lot more power to shape and direct that project on a 40R than we do with a 40B. So 40R project, for example, is going to be the post office, which just got past uh, CPDC. There's another proposal for 24 Gould Street. Uh, for those not familiar with it, that's the, old, that's the EMARC building. Um, also downtown, that's going to be that, that proposed for mixed use that hasn't been uh, approved yet by CPDC, but the neighbors and the developer have been working together. So between those three projects, um, you know, you're going to be bringing a lot of people downtown, and it's mostly one and two bedrooms. So, you know, the, the, the theory is, is that it's not going to really impact the number of school children because it's going to be mostly younger families, maybe uh, younger households that are going to be there, maybe take the train to work, um, that it's not going to be sort of families um, like you have, like, you know, where I live on the west side, who want to you know, walk over to Barrow. So, um, you know, it's sort of, it, it's, it's growth, but it, it probably won't have as much impact uh, on school, you know, on the number of school kids that come in as some of the other projects that have. And been the there. good news is that Reading has reached its limit for 40B for affordable yes, housing. Thanks for, yes, so basically <coughs> we've done such a good job in kind of working with the developers, working with the neighbors, working with the state, that, um, that the Commonwealth, they, they basically granted us kind of a, a two-year, I don't want to say moratorium, but a two-year kind of Pause. stay of execution. <laughs> Pause. Pause. <laughs> so, so what that means now is that, is that we can now take the next two years and really work on developing the projects that we want to do. 
we're, you know, that we can actually control as opposed to having to stop what we're doing and now work with some developer who has no interest in Reading at all, just wants to kind of do his 40B and, and leave. Um, and you know, it, it just, it, it, and then we get what we get. We don't get what, you know, what we want. So now we have two years to kind of stop that process and really work on trying to figure out to develop those parcels that we've identified that had from development opportunity to them and get that down the road so that we can really grow, um, grow our revenue. So oh, that's that's good news for us. That's great news. And, it and took a lot of work, though. It was a lot. Yeah, it was it was yeah. really really difficult in 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 doing that. But you know, we've reached it. And you know, the, the thing is, though, is that you know we're, they're going to do the census in 2020. More households will come in. We maybe fall below the 10 percent. Now you got to chase it again. So you know, but oh, yeah. at least now for two years, you know, it's a moving target. It's a, it's always a moving target. But you know, I think that we've, you know, that we've worked real hard in. Uh, in trying to, obviously we need to create affordable housing, we just can't, you know, can't be just, you know, high income housing, we have to have, have some component of affordable. Um, but by doing that, not only is it the right thing, but we can control our destiny a little bit better, so. Thank you for sharing your, your expertise and your willingness and your time to be here. Okay, let's move on to the uh, Reading Senior Aid Program. Joe, would you like yeah, to I, talk I about this? Yeah, I mentioned that we're going we're gonna to devote some time to this. Um, we're not going to bore you to tears, but it is something that's timely, number one, and very important to the recipients of, uh, of the tax relief. Um, as I mentioned earlier, the Senior Tax Relief Program was something that the selectmen um, worked on extensively in concert with um, our town assessor um, who brought us the kinds of, he explained to us the tools that we could use because we really felt that there was a fairly significant challenge for some of our seniors to stay in town um, given you know the accelerating values of their property which then is followed by the accelerating cost of their taxes. But their, their tax bill may be the biggest bill they face. Uh, in given, many cases. Many are in paid up homes, they don't have a mortgage and uh, correct. many are you know single seniors living on a social security check. It, for many of them it is not only the biggest bill they have, it is a high percentage of their um, spendable income. And so we felt and you know ultimately town meeting agreed and then we had the cooperation of both uh, Brad Jones, Jim Dwyer, mm -hmm. and Jason Lewis um, to navigate a special acts, act of the Massachusetts legislature in order to in, in, enable us to enact a Reading Senior Aid Program, one of three in the state. Um, we were faced with a decision how to qualify someone. Um, we didn't think it made sense to hire a new person create another bureaucracy when there was something in place that actually made a lot of sense. Um, so there way, is a way of pre-vetting people, if you will. Correct. Yeah. Um, you know, the Ma Massachusetts has an income tax circuit breaker credit, um, and that is designed around a qualifying statement um, that is backed up with documentation to the state, and it creates um, a state income tax um, protection for people who qualify. And that can provide up to $1,070 this year of income tax savings. Mm -hmm. When we looked at this, we made a decision that this was a good qualifying tool and decided to embrace it as the tool that we would use, at least for now, in qualifying people for this program. Um, and essentially what we did was we looked to 1% of our revenue stream uh, from the taxes and said let's create a pool of money that would be shared by qualifying neighbors and residents um, um, so that their income tax, their real estate taxes could be each on a year by year basis be reduced and give them and create some relief for them. What we talked about when we put the act in place was not only a 1% pool from the revenue stream but also a multiplier to say that based on circumstances as we understood them, uh, go back to what 
Dan told you what our powers and duties are um, under the real estate classification and rates, we could use an amount equal to 50% of the circuit breaker or up to 200% of the circuit breaker tax credit. So, for example, in this year, the circuit breaker income tax credit at the state level is $1,070. Um, if we chose 100% of that, $1,070 would be saved. Mm -hmm. We chose, based on the amount of applicants that we had, um, to use a 200% number. And so just multiply it times two, I think it's $2,140 mm -hmm. is the maximum that somebody could qualify for. Keep in mind that the circuit breaker doesn't automatically give you the maximum. It's right. based on your qualification application. Sliding scale on income. Too. Sliding scale really on income yep. is what it boils down to. So you could have a credit of um, five or $600. You could have a credit of $2,140. It really is tied to your qualifying application. Now in Reading this year, um, we actually had 190 two, I believe, applicants. In order to qualify, um, you had to be, in addition to the circuit breaker qualification that the state has, you had to be a current Reading homeowner who's resided in town for 10 or more consecutive years. That's really important. It doesn't require that you lived in the same house. You might have made a decision to downsize five years, seven years Well, you may have rented ago. and then bought your house. Correct. Either way. Um, but the point is that you've been You've been in town for 10 years and that you are currently a Reading homeowner. And those are the key ingredients. As I mentioned, <clears throat> I believe we had 192 applicants, 181 qualified. Mm -hmm. Well, what disqualified somebody that might have qualified under the circuit breaker? <clears throat> you have to own the home yourself. And what we discovered in, the in 10 or 11 cases were that the um, the applicants had already put their homes in trust, trust. Mm -hmm. so they didn't actually own the homes any further. Um, all in all, uh, the cost of this aid at 200% of the circuit breaker with 181 applicants tied to the way that their sliding scale qualifications come is $362,000. Now, where does that come from? There's not a pool of money. It doesn't come from Budgets. It doesn't come from budgets anywhere. It doesn't come from FinCom invading the rainy day account. Mm -hmm. it, is, it is a shift of 362000 to be shared among the other taxpayers, the other you know, real estate taxpayers. And so the way this was designed was that <clears throat> the law says it has to be shared among residents. Because it's a residential savings, it had to be shared among residents. Mm -hmm. We felt that was obviously made sense. However, we felt that because we've got commercial property owners, they should share as well mm -hmm. in the cost of this in an amount appropriately equal to what their share of the revenue stream is. So here in town, we've got approximately 92% of the revenue stream that comes in from residential homeowners. We've got about 8% that comes in from commercial and investment property. Um, and so, roughly speaking, we split the tax rate for the first time ever in an amount appro approximately equal to parity. The idea was to create parity between commercial uh, property owners, residential property owners, to share as, as it would be appropriate with them the cost of this $362,000. That will be reflected in the tax bills coming out. The one thing I do want to say for those people that are watching and most interested in this, there, there, it is, it's possible that somebody who has gotten a grant from the circuit breaker, um, it, they could conceivably, because of the savings in their real estate taxes, disqualify be themselves next year yeah. or have a reduced or have it redu a reduced benefit more likely yeah. um, and you know we're not in the tax pre preparation business although for many seniors we do have professional volunteer assistance mm -hmm. we would advise any senior who has any question about that to speak with their tax preparer um, or reach out to us um, we can't do your taxes for you um, but we can we can certainly help you and point you in the right direction so you can get good advice about that. It's the only one thing that you need to be 
um, paying attention to that could have an impact negatively in the in the following tax year. So I think that's a I wouldn't want to abbreviate that anymore and happy to you know expand on it if somebody wants to contact myself or any one of the other selectmen directly or the town assessor um, you could feel free to do that and we'll kind of take it from there. That kind of leads us to the property tax classification. Before we go there John thank you for that. Uh, in addition uh, many have asked us uh, including town meeting members well we're, we're very happy with the senior aid program but is there something else we could offer to low income people of other age groups, uh, people who may be down, they'll walk out of a job, uh, have reduced income in a given year, and except for their age, would actually qualify for something like this. Uh, I want to say the board is certainly open to those ideas. Uh, there are no, right now, I'm not aware of any state programs we could piggyback it on. As John said, we, we don't want to hire an administrator to, to, to do our own program, but we are open to suggestions and ideas for doing that. We're not opposed to it. Uh, Although the state really has no provision for a special act no. for other age groups. Yeah, we, okay. we, yeah. Would, we would be pushing our luck on a special yeah. act for that, I think. We, but we, if you well, piggyback off a current program, you're in better shape. Well, one yeah. comment I have heard in the last few weeks is that uh, some people believe that this was done, uh, the process of creating this, um, say, loophole or reduction for seniors, for a circuit break or, or tax reduction was because of uh, you believed an override was eminent. And uh, people say, well, if we have an override, that will certainly be more of benefit to the seniors. And if we don't have an override, are we going to pull the senior tax program back? But this is something the state has already established as, a, yeah. as an acceptable venue for seniors, and regardless of I'd like to speak to that, actually. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I, I think that's a fair question. Um, some people have thought. Um, and some people have said, I'll just finish my thought. Some mm -hmm. people have said, well, if they get it, then they'll have the money to pay for the override. And it's like, no, that's not no, really how it works when you're no. a senior. Actually, yeah. no. long before there was you know, uh, an imminent override discussion, the discussion on senior tax relief on the property taxes started almost four years ago. Um, okay. And it took us almost two years to get to something that made some sense that actually would, you know, make muster through the state legislature. Yep. Mm -hmm. So this was done, believe me, far in advance of any discussion of override. Um, in my opinion, it is, you know, exclusive of override discussion. Mm -hmm. um, it was designed around you know, helping those people stay in town mm -hmm. that would like to stay in town. I mean, so for example, you know, as we heard, you know, when I became a selectman four years ago, one of the things I heard from a lot of, uh, of our senior residents were, as the, I get that the value of my property is going up, but I have to live somewhere. Yeah. yeah. Um, and so as the property goes up in value, they can't convert that into income. Their income is fixed. Their real estate taxes, which is their largest bill, is growing rather exponentially, and everybody's living longer. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, there's kind of a perfect storm yeah. that we really needed to address. So, it is coincidental timing, but believe me, one has nothing to do with the other. The other thing I will tell you is that the feedback we received from the state, from many state legislators who really had nothing to do with with Reading, you know, there, I mean, we've got our we've got our people in the state house, you know, we've got a senator and two representatives. The feedback we got through uh, Brad Jones, particularly the House Minority Leader, was the state looked at this and said, "These guys are thinking ahead. These guys are doing the things that they need to do for their seniors." And you know, I think, frankly, based on the feedback we've heard, we're likely to see something similar to this find its way into state law over, you know, okay. over time. Okay. So, I believe me, it's not, you know, it was never designed around um, something to give to the seniors so that they would be able to survive the override. That, that's they not are how mutually budget, exclusive. That's not how budgeting goes in households no, either. No, no, no. So, um, you know, everyone has to make a valuation on their finances. That and, is correct. And, uh, and, uh, this, this selectman, I'll speak for myself, uh, I fully understand the argument that a person on a fixed income 
cannot afford to see their tax bill go up more than the statutory 2.5% a year, uh, notwithstanding the, the very valid needs of the town. Uh, so that, that, that is a totally valid point of view to hold. Uh, I, I certainly would hold it against anyone. Uh, and uh, I commit to uh, operating this town on whatever budget the voters give us. Yeah. We will do our best to make a case for a little more money this year and uh, most especially from the selectmen for the police and fire needs of this town, although uh, the school committee is certainly going to present their needs also. Yeah. So there are needs around. and yeah, There's you know, no doubt about it. I, one of the things that we can't lose sight of when you do something like senior tax relief, you know, morally speaking, we're empowering people to stay in the place that they've spent part or all of their life. We had a very poignant letter uh, without involving yes, the... Yes, we did. Yeah. And you know, it was it was really it was a thank you letter mm -hmm. for allowing this person to stay in their home. The interesting thing is that, um, frankly, our our cost of support systems for the elderly are in the in the low hundreds of dollars. Um, when a when one of our yeah. retired people needs to make a decision that it's time to move away from their home. They either can't keep up with it. Um, look, we welcome the young families that have come to now, and many of them have come. Um, you know, and as I said Including to you, one earlier, of yours. yeah, I mean, you know, my, you know, there's a there's a young family of of mm -hmm. two right now that don't have any children yet that you know are married, just bought a new house. My son and his wife. Um, you know, if we're blessed, if we're all blessed with grandchildren and children, they're gonna. There's a cost of that, mm -hmm. you know, and you know we're spending somewhere in the thirteen to fourteen thousand dollar range, and you know, frankly, the house that they bought um, was from, a, you know, the the original seen, owners of that yeah. of that home were a couple that raised their children there, and uh, were living, you know, when they last lived there, the cost of the town was infinitesimal. Yeah. Um, when my good. son has two or three children. Um, the costs change rather dramatically, and, I, and yeah. you know something? Yeah. That's not that's not a complaint. That's, that's just, just a that's happens. just an observation of yeah. reality. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And you know what? When the time is right for a property turnover and for a young family to get started and enjoy Reading, it's a wonderful thing. Um, but it's also a wonderful thing for somebody who's spent their whole life to be able to stay there as long as they choose to stay there right. without the right. without they've the implication support, of tax. They've supported um, schools, they've correct. supported yeah. overrides, they've yeah. supported everything yeah. that the majority has voted on. You know, on. Linda, one of the things that sometimes polarizing groups can, you know, forget to understand when they speak to a selectman, because we're talking about how selectmen interact with the citizens. Mm -hmm. We represent everybody here. Yes. We represent, you know, people who are in their 70s or 80s. We represent people who are in their 20s, 30s, or 40s. I mean, we represent everyone here, and have to try to do our best to balance um, the needs, the needs, yeah. the services, mm -hmm. and the revenue stream. And as Dan points out aptly, um, the voters will always decide how much we have to work with, right. and they'll tell us what we've got, and then we will make do. Um, so. Thanks, John. Yep. Okay, um, I'm going to try to make the subject of property tax classification uh, a simple one. I don't want to get down the wonky details of this, but uh, this all uh, came about, uh, I think it was under the same, uh, either the Citizens Initiative petition that started Prop 2.5, or, or the legislature might have put it in effect shortly after, but um, <clears throat> selectmen and mayors, I think it's mayors and cities, are given the, the power to uh, classify tax rates and discriminate between two classes of property in setting tax rates, one being residential and one being uh, what's called CIP, which stands for Commercial, Industrial, and Personal Property, uh, whereby uh, you add up all, all the assessed value in the community, uh, you look at your total tax levy, and you decide, is there a way, do you want to set a differential rate that's different from one class to the other? And in Reading, uh, we have a situation where 92%, give or take, of our property valuation is in the residential class. Only about 8% is in that other class, which includes commercial, industrial, personal property. If you look at a town like Burlington, uh, the, it's almost an even split, and I think the commercial might be slightly ahead in value from the residential. 
Now, the nice thing in Burlington is uh, the selectman there can say, I want to grant $10 of tax relief on the tax rate to the residents, and I'm going to move that $10 and it'll only be $10 over to the commercial people. And they do that. It's a one-to-one. -one. Uh, $10 saved here saves $10 here. Unfortunately, we have a 92 to 8 ratio here in Reading. And if you go through all the, the math, which is boring, but not that complicated, uh, you'll find that uh, it's almost a 10 to 1 to give a, uh, a dollar of tax relief to the resident here. You would have to increase the average tax bill by 10. That's a very rough metric, but I'm just doing it as an illustration. And that explains why for many, many years, up until just a few weeks ago, the Board of Selectmen has never split the tax rate in Reading because of the disproportionate impact that it would have on our commercial properties. And let me add that uh, the state law does not allow us to discriminate in how we split that rate among the small businesses and the large. Many of us wish it did, because I think it would have produced a different result probably years ago, where we would tax you know, the big entities, the Jordans, the Home Depots, the larger buildings at a higher rate than, than our commercial uh, people on Main Street. Unfortunately, uh, it's one class of property. So if you do that differential shift, you do it to everybody, which can have a really devastating effect to a small business, given that, uh, yes, we can give a small commercial exemption, but those apply very strict. The rules are very arcane and such that. Well, and they apply, we, generally speaking, to the building owner. Yes. And in most of our small businesses, the small businesses building. do not own the building. And then you, so, all, all mean, businesses within a given building would have to uh, pass a, the, the quality, muster yeah, the, under the... We discovered yeah. that out of <clears throat> the nearly 300 businesses in Reading, um, and there's of all description, you know, some out of the home and so forth, um, there were about... Um, our assessor estimates that there were about four businesses that would benefit from the small business exemption. It's just not a tool that applies necessarily in Reading. So it's one that um, we haven't been able to utilize right. in, moving the, in, in moving the shift around uh, to give relief. So now, uh, We took a vote a couple of weeks ago to actually do an extremely small shift in the <coughs> tax rate to the commercial industrial properties to uh, help share the cost of the senior aid uh, such that uh, instead of a 92 to 8 split of the senior aid between residential and commercial, it's more like a 75-25 split. That is going to result in a, uh, I would, in my judgment, not a punitive, but a somewhat noticeable tax increase. Uh, it's under 1%, I believe, uh, over what it would have been. With well, it was designed rate. around parity. It was yeah. designed around yeah. sharing the it's load. It's a small wiggle from parity. Um, but <clears throat> it's... Um, like 1.00. It's a little larger than parity, um, and you know, uh, as a result, we, we didn't pass unanimously. Yeah. But, yeah. Um, uh, but I don't want to digress into that. I mean, sure. the point is that it is less than one percent, right. and propositions in the past have been as much as ten and twenty percent. Mm -hmm. This shift is less than one percent. So I want to go through a, a commonly misunderstood aspect of tax classification. Uh, and I've read so much stuff in social media saying, well, <laughs> if the selectmen would just split the property tax, we would realize so much additional revenue from the commercial sector. Why don't they do it? Why are they asking us for overrides? Well, I think the town manager spoke to this in his. It's like, he, there is a limit. I don't think we can speak yeah. enough time. So let me just encapsulate. Yeah. I'm sure uh, Barry and uh, Bob did a much more thorough job. But uh, think of, uh, we, we get income from a number of sources in town. Uh, we have water and sewer rates that bring in, and we have state aid, we have other governmental transfers. Of the $100 million annual budget, about 60, 000, 60 million, give or take, comes from the property tax 62 levy. 62. 62? Okay, that 62 can grow statutorily. Is that a word? Okay, yeah, it is yeah. now. Uh, by 2.5% a year, plus an allowance for new growth. So it has, the taxes, naturally grow between two and a half and three plus percent a year because of that new growth. Only if the voters of the town authorize an operating uh, override can that grow more. Tax classification does not increase that pie, the size of the pie, the 62 million beyond what the two and a half percent would allow. What it does do is cut the pie differently between the residents and the commercial sector. Uh, so. 
You could split it 50-50. You could. And you, a resident, would save money, and two-thirds of the businesses in would this probably town go out of town. would yeah. likely yeah. leave town. Yeah. Yeah. Or go out of business, one but or the it, other. It, my bigger point was it doesn't increase the, t the property Correct. tax levy, the amount we can yes. raise by taxes. Uh, so please don't walk around with that in your heads because it's not true. <laughs> we couldn't, we'd never get our tax rate certified by the state if we did that. Uh, it just couldn't be allowed to happen by the state. Uh, if your tax rate went up more than 2.5% a year, there could be other factors in play. It could be uh, that you There was an assessment this year? Well, and here's another thing, yeah. It, if the assessments and rating all went up 10% this year, by golly, that means my taxes are going up 10%. Not true. Again, uh, to the degree that the assessment rises faster than the two and a half, the rate must, by law, drop, such that the product you know, of assessment times rate, which is the tax levy, grows only within that allowable two and a half plus new growth. That's a, it's a lot to say, but... Going right into the weeds here, Dan. Going into the weeds. Yeah. <laughs> it's, it's really just that tough old sixth grade... It is. I mean, it's... it's about it. yeah. Actually, a visual aid is probably... There's a lot of moving yeah. parts to it. Dan, yeah. I think you did a beautiful job of explaining it. I'm only... Okay. I'm That's teasing right. you a That's little okay. bit. But, because it's... <clears throat> it's simple math. It's a... Con it, the, the concept is a little more complex. Yeah. yeah. Um, the math is actually very straightforward, and Dan pointed it out. Um, you know, uh, no one's happy with taxes going up. Yeah. Everyone's happy with the services that they get, generally so, speaking. So if your taxes went up more than two and a half, your property value may have increased disproportionately to your neighbors or to the surrounding town. If, if all of renting goes up 10%, that's not gonna make you go up uh, at a greater rate than they, but it, it's how you go up or down relative t to your peer properties. One matters. thing that happened this year, I believe it was this year, if I remember <coughs> if I it correctly, was that the library came online, the debt yeah, for the did. library. Yes. So that brought everyone's you, taxes different true. than what they were last year. And it is year. important, right. you mentioned it earlier. So it went up. It's a temporary tax. And my escrow right. went up 150 years. a month, I know. For yeah. 10 years, so. Yep. Yep. Um, yeah, it's a, it's a temporary tax. Um, and it's one of those things that, um, the vo again, this comes back to voter decision. Right. You know, the voters decided that they wanted that money uh, to be spent, and so there was an ex a debt exclusion in order to pay for it. Your taxes have to go up for the win window of time that um, it takes to pay it off. And we, we want to be very transparent about what's coming up in the way of capital projects. So when if a question goes on the ballot for an operational override, people have some idea of what to expect in the future. Uh, future school needs, uh, the Killam School has been talked about for years. Uh, we're working out uh, reimbursement formulas with the state. That's been a long discussion with yeah. the state for that school. There's a lot of talk about uh, moving our DPW. It's in the early stages. It could be promising, but uh, I, for one, am going to ask for a lot of numbers and a, a great pro forma analysis of how that would actually work out in the long run before uh, I want to go forward with it. Because I watched them move it 30 years ago. <laughs> I know what that was like. Uh, but there, there's some exciting things that we might get done in the way of you know, economic development if we can do that. Uh, again, all the numbers have to add up. And yeah. We'll be transparent through the whole process. In my opinion, it's our number one obligation, and that is to keep the health and safety of our citizens first and foremost. Um, we've got an interesting thing going on here in Reading, and we've done some studies, and I want to share that with those with our viewing audience. Um, if we look at the last 50 years of Reading, um, essentially 1970 to the present, um, and I'm exaggerating, I'm not exaggerating, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm approximating, shall we say. Um, but what we know since 1971 to today is that Reading's population, this is true, has grown by 20% in that period of time. And here's what else we know, that in that period of time, there have been many additional single-family and multi-family housing units that have been built. We also know in that period of time, Walker's Brook and that whole commercial area has been developed. Mm -hmm. We also know, and I'll say some familiar names to everybody in the viewing audience, um, Redding Woods, Redding Commons, Johnson's Woods. These are all um, housing developments that have helped to develop a couple of things. One is a bigger population. 
Um, secondly, some additional revenue streams um, that have both come from the real value of the property as well as one of the things we've discovered this year is there's a lot more cars in town. All you have to do is drive <laughs> around and know that. Excise tax. Uh, and we have more excise tax. And what we have coming, Postmark Square, for example, the redevelopment of the, uh, of the um, old post office. And it's you know, going to be quite beautiful. We've seen that report. Uh, the other night, CPDC um, set in place the, um, uh, the redevelopment of the EMARC property you know, on Gould Street. Um, there's a 40B that has come in, and as you, most of you know, um, we wrestled with um, to bring it into some semblance of reasonable compliance over on Lincoln Street by the train station. All of these are contributing to a substantial growth of both population and places to cover for police, fire, and dispatch. Um, Can I just density, put a note yeah. in there? Sure. Uh, for some of these uh, higher density developments, especially in condos, uh, it's not so much of an impact to the school system because they tend to be one and two. Better. Oh, yeah. Um, However, yeah. Uh, they do generate a lot of uh, calls to the police. Uh, well, for example, I mean, you know, Reading Commons, you know, probably has a lot more children yes. than Reading Woods. Because they have three bedrooms. Reading Woods right. is more designed around uh, an over 55. And single family homes, obviously, <coughs> yes. um, by children. And Johnson Woods is probably mixed. There are some children in there, but then there are some people well, that have mostly moved in not. there with, yep. without yeah, children. There's like That's nine children in that home. There's over 55, yeah. But the interesting thing is that places like Walkersbrook, for example, and places, you know, like uh, Reading Commons, just yeah. by the nature of you know who of what's there of what's mm -hmm. going on the activities level yeah. um, it's not about there's bad people good people it's oh. the activity level alerts public safety more often whether it's a you know an EMT call you know or a call for a traffic accident or a call for shoplifting I mean a lot more activity mm -hmm. is going on yet in that window of time when we've had a 20% increase in all this development, um, the, there is virtually no change in the headcount um, in police and fire since that, over that whole window of time. So we're doing the same thing with all that excess growth and excess population with the same amount of, of officers. Not to mention the other challenges. Well, and this, and, you know, the environment is different for them as well. We are, as we all know, the opioid crisis is is just overwhelming, and that that particular opioid crisis is very intensely involved with our public, public safety. safety. Yeah. Uh, I mean, the responses to overdoses are unbelievable. Sadly, the amount of deaths are up. For some reason, in our society today, we seem to have more domestic abuse activity that goes on. I mean, in general, two things are true. Our public safety officers and firefighters have more ground to cover, more people to protect, and a more difficult environment than they've had, to do with yet it, yeah. we've got no real increases. And this, <coughs> this will become a tipping point very shortly. Yeah. One of the things that I would like to not much of a chart guy when it's about talking about things, but there is a chart I'd like to put up relative to the police staffing comparison. Um, I don't know if we can get that up. Yeah, there we go. I, I want to draw your attention. This is a this is a chart that again, my good friend Dan took a lot of raw data and reconfigured it in a, I think what's going to be a real user friendly thing for those of those watching this. I draw your attention to the two highlighted lines. The one in the middle, no surprise, is the average. Um, this is the average of our um, um, communities that we compare ourselves to. So the headings are? Yeah, so the towns are listed on your far left. Uh, starts with Burlington, ends with Lexington, and they're tied to you know several things. Population in the second column, um, the amount of sworn officers in the third column, and the fourth column tells you how many officers there are available um, to service every thousand citizens. 
And I will point out to you that the average sits in the middle and you'll notice that Redding is the highlighted line down near the bottom, down in the, in the lower quadrant. So what you find is that the average of all of our peer communities has 1.8 officers per thousand citizens. We are down at 1.6. And that doesn't sound like a lot, but it's a 20% reduction. Um, and that is substantial. Six from the bottom. Now, here's the other thing that's pretty interesting. <clears throat> when something happens, so for example, we had a bomb scare. We had a big fire. All of these are things that have happened recently in the, in the, in the very, very recent past. And what we discover is that we're going to have to call for mutual aid, and that's what it's called. When we can't keep up with it because we don't have enough policemen on the street to handle the crisis and take care of All your regular attention safety. goes to the crisis. So, yeah, and so what you have to do is you go to mutual aid. Yeah. Literally. Yeah. And so you look around and you look at, let's look at all the towns, for example. Um, if you want, if we could put that chart back up, it'd be great. Um, the towns that we would normally go to are our neighbors. Mm -hmm. Wilmington, which is, I would say, uh, fifth or sixth, they're actually, they have, they have two. Yeah. Uh, you know, so right. we've actually got of our neighbors one, two, three above the average, and two below the average, but ahead of Reading. So if you look at the five contiguous neighbors that we have, every one of those police departments has more officers per thousand citizens than we do. And the interesting thing about that is, some of them that we might reach to are also below the average. So what happens if you got a crisis in two right. places at yeah, once? Exactly. This is real. This is something that we've got to be concerned with. I want to give you an example. If you went to the police blotter for last Saturday, here's what you would have found. That in a window of time that wasn't exactly all at the same time, but contiguous, we had an overdose that resulted in a, in, a, in a heart stoppage and, a, hmm. and Nikan, or the um, Narcan. Narcan was applied and the person was brought back to life in Reading. In a contiguous way, there was a person, a domestic situation in a public place, a person threatening suicide hmm. that had to be uh, dealt with. And right attached to that was a case of drunken driving in the town square. Now, let's think about that. You've got three pretty serious things going on all at one time. And you know, that can happen. And when that happens, and you've got four cruisers out That's there because you, you see the problem that we have. <clears throat> this public safety issue is going to have to be addressed. And this is one of the things that Frankly, from my perspective, and I don't want to speak for Dan, but I, I think we've talked about the fact that we're very concerned that we've got to look at how to fund um, the proper amount of police and, and firemen. There's, a, there's actually a very similar chart that I'm going to draw your attention to for firefighters, and I'll run through it quickly. Um, and this is the firefighter chart. Again, Dan helped me here. Um, the average, somewhere in the, just below the middle, um, is 1.97 firefighters per thousand citizens. You'll notice Reading, again, probably about 15 or 20 percent off the average. And only, frankly, only two of our neighbors are ahead of us. But therein lies another problem. Yep. Think about this. These, yeah. are the, these are where we're looking for mutual aid. Yep. And they're in a similar situation to what we're in. Mm -hmm. And on this chart, if you take a hard look at it, um, <laughs> ALS, what does that stand for? Advanced against? Life Support. That means our paramedics yeah. are uh, yeah. equipped to handle uh, tr severe trauma and uh, uh, situations that go way beyond the basic life uh, support that you see in many towns. So uh, the BLS designation is basic life support in that town, and the ALS designates advanced life support. We are advanced life support and have gotten many uh, kudos for the quality of our team. And I think where you're going, John, is that many of the uh, adjacent communities from which we would require 
uh, support yeah. our basic life support. Or or no life or support. No life, uh, well, they must have something. Well, I they, don't know what the blank means. No, they actually call they call in oh, somebody else. Oh, they private ambulance. Yeah. Okay, yeah. that's what that So means. we've got three of our neighbors that yeah. might rely on us. Right. And we're, yeah. supp we're supplying ourselves. Yeah. The point is And we're this, undermanned. Uh, we are undermanned and we know it. Underwoman. And if we need more staffing, the mutual aid, the, the places we would naturally go, our contiguous neighbors, are in similar circumstances. And so this is also a problem that is going to have to be addressed. I think to summarize that, um, we've had no increases in public safety headcount in the last 50 years in either of our major departments. Um, with the current staffing, fire departments can, you know, really only support one major incident without needing to resort to mutual aid. And that's a problem um, because the mutual aid will come, but it le there's a, an exposure every place that yeah, that, that is left. Yes. And mm -hmm. God knows that in today's society, things happen massively when you don't expect them. Um, interestingly, in our police officers, generally there are only four sworn police officers per shift. Think about that. Think about last Saturday night. Three of them were tied up, all pretty much around the same time. And do you really just want to send one police officer for Sometimes you a domestic And then domestic what happens if you get a call for whatever, yeah. a break-in, a domestic uh, problem? I, it's a situation we, that has got to be addressed and dealt with. And, and I this think we're affects, be, this situation of public safety affects every single person, yes, man, does. woman, child. Absolutely. Of it, every uh, age. Mm -hmm. all and it down. doesn't matter whether you live in a single family home right like each of us does, or whether you, you know, you, you live in Redding Woods where, you know, you're, you're in a, your own place, but, you know. When you make that emergency call, someone needs to be there. Somebody yeah. needs to be there. I mean, in general, the staffing study that was cited and that where we've looked concluded that Redding is down at least four firefighters and five police officers. And the idea of the five police officers is you need at least one more per shift. And we also, frankly, if we're going to solve, if we're going to begin to make more inroads into this opioid thing, we're going to have to expand the resource officers beyond just the high school. We really need to get into the, at least the middle schools and let these kids know that they have a confidant, they have a friend in the mm -hmm. police, and that's going to be really important. Um, these, really, these critical funding issues are going to have to be brought to the attention of the voters for their advice and consent when they really understand it. But, that's a that's a really a thumbnail, honestly, Linda. I think the public safety issue would be something you should entertain as it's kind of its own topic. Mm. You know, maybe with uh, the I think two the chiefs town here manager, and, and the yeah, town manager. More, we'd like I would, to invite them to come. And yeah, I would strongly and recommend that. Uh, yeah. Sure. Yeah. So that's pretty much. You know. I hope we covered some ground that you were interested in covering and that... Uh, well, it's not, uh, it's what our, our uh, community yes. residents need to hear because this is going to be talked about over the next yes, few months. And, and I thought an overview by all of you personally on subjects that you are familiar with, we can get into it in a little more depth in this kind of an environment right. because at the meetings there's always a goal to accomplish a vote to take yep. for a specific purpose. Yep. And sometimes the conversation gets a little heavy <coughs> on the yep. issue, and because the the purpose needs to be fulfilled that evening. But um, I think I hope our our uh, community members feel that this is this is helpful to them in understanding how our sure. how our town works. Well, I'm sure that you're going to ask for feedback. I'm sure you're going to get it. Yeah, we, we look forward to that. Yeah. Absolutely. Right. Thanks for having us, I, and thank thanks to RCTV well, for thanks you know too. setting up this, you know hosting this, and allowing you to create a forum for us to have this kind of discussion. I, you know. Well, I thank you for making the time. This has been no small effort for all of us yeah. over the uh, the fall and the summer <clears throat> with developing this program, and I'd like to thank you for sharing this information with sure. us today. <clears throat> we hope you found this information helpful and even insightful. We encourage you to cash, catch all of the three one-hour segments on the topics we mentioned and give us feedback on subjects you'd like to know a little more about and how we're doing to address those. Thank you, gentlemen, again, for your service to our community and the long hours and efforts you put on behind the scenes in the preparation that goes into conducting town business 
before the public meetings even take place. Even our preparation for this has required some effort on your part, and I appreciate that. We need to be thankful for many things, <clears throat> excuse me, and we would like to thank you again for all you do to make Reading a great place to live, work, and to raise a family. Thank you, Linda. We said hello, Reading, at the start of the show. Thank you for watching us. And now we'll say goodbye until the next show. Thank you for watching. <laughs>